Hello friends, thank you for joining me again today for the second half of this painting process. Everything on the canvas right now is acrylics, so of course it's all dry. And I'm about to move on into the oil phase. Now, a couple comments, and I got these again the last two weeks while I've been teaching. Why switch to oil? Couldn't you just continue in acrylics? The answer, of course, absolutely you could. Um, it's hard to answer that uh, objectively. <laughs> so let me be subjective just for a minute. Virtually all of my paintings are done in this technique. Acrylic underneath, oil on top. Most of the acrylics are transparent glazes. And the first thing I'm going to do in oil is an oil glaze. Every time when I do this oil glaze, something deep inside me goes, ah, finally. <laughs> and it's not because I am, trust me, it is not because I am emotionally attached to oils or the idea of being oil. No, 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 that. It's purely visceral. The oil glaze, I, I don't know how much, how to say this with adult words, so I won't. The oil glaze is just so much prettier. It's just so much, mmm, richer, nicer, smoother, transparent, intense. Uh, none of those words are exactly right, but all of them together give the idea. The oil glaze. Now, can people do good paintings in acrylics? And, and again, I'm I sort of often have in mind those of you who are acrylic painters because you're scaredy cats and you're afraid of oil because your daddy or your grandpa somebody bought oil paints from Sherwin Williams a hundred years ago and you remember the smell of mineral spirits but please understand that oil artist oil paints are not the same as a Home Depot they don't even sell the oil paints anymore Home Depot Lowe's and Ace Hardware but when they did those were, those were petroleum distillates. There are no petroleum distillates. There are virtually none in the oil painting process. Now, having said that, I, will, I will, must admit that the liquid that I use, as you know, is, is odiferous. It does combustible. So this does have petroleum distillates in it or something. But um, none of the oil paints do. So this, this, is, this one product is creating a smell. And a, and you want to be aware of that. I've got a fan going on. I've got a strong intake air coming on here, and and because uh, uh, there's going to be a, the room is going to be filled with this smell and fume in just a minute. After I do it, I will take a break and get out of here and let it settle down before I come back. But anyway, um, yes, you can finish in acrylics. I know, like John Poon, for instance, does gorgeous paintings in acrylics. But I will hasten to add, yeah, but he's a freaking genius. Dan Johnson, a local friend, does gorgeous, hyper-realistic paintings in acrylics. But he's a freaking genius. You just about have to be a freaking genius to do good, realistic paintings in acrylics. I'm exaggerating slightly. But the point is, oils are so much easier. So anyway, uh, I am switching to oil because I'll, it feels better. Okay, now, what am I going to do? First thing I'm going to do is glaze the entire canvas. Now, here's what I require. Those, if any of my students from the last couple of weeks are watching, you say, yep, yep, that's what he did. He made us say that. At this point in the painting, your painting process, uh, you, are, you look at your painting and you must say this. You must say, put your hand on your chin, stroke your chin a little bit, say, hmm, I like it pretty much. Okay? That's the most. Or you could say, no, I love it. You, you're allowed to say that. What you're not, not allowed to say is, oh, I like it, like it, like it. <clears throat> no, 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 no. So this is just an exercise in, forgive me, the power of real thinking. You don't say, I, you say, I like it pretty much, but I wish it was more blank. And the blank is a color, not lighter, darker, not better. <laughs> I like it pretty much, but I wish it was better. No, 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 no. I like it pretty much, but I wish it was blank, and the blank is a color. Warmer, cooler, redder, bluer, greener, browner, not lighter or darker. No, 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 not a value, not a value, a color purple or bluer. Or you could say, I like it pretty much, but I wish it was less yellow, less purple, less green, less blue, less red. You understand? So it's a color shift. What I'm trying to get at is two things. One is you have to say, I like it pretty much. And because I know how you guys are, <laughs> if, I don't, if I don't harass you, <laughs> you will 
you will mealy mouth, bad mouth yourself and say, yeah, that's just not a good place to paint from. Okay, so I like it pretty much. Now here's one of the ironies in this case. Uh, not only do I like it, I like the color balance very much the way it is. So uh, I, don't, I don't want it warmer. I don't want it cooler. I don't want it more orange. A little more blue in the sky. But uh, so I like it actually quite a bit. That's the truth. I like it quite a bit. Um, but I don't want to shift the color, really any that I can see. So I'm simply going to push it in the direction that it's already going. It's got blue in the sky, more blue. Got warm here, more warm. Got greenish something warm here, more that, cooler. So I'm just going to darken the whole thing slightly. And uh, how am I going to do that? Um, I'm going to start different. I don't, I don't, do, this is pretty unusual. My most common, so let me point you at my, my uh, palette here just for a minute. My most common go-to process in my glazing is, is to go with oxide red and ultramarine blue. Those are the two colors that I use the most. Anyway, I want you to see, I've got about two tablespoons, quite a bit, and I'll probably, for a 36 by 48 inch painting, I'll probably have to put out even more liquid than this before I'm done. And I'm slathering up my brushes, getting them pretty, pretty soaked with uh, liquid. By the, by the way, yes, I, if you take a class from me, you must have one of these brushes. You cannot use, well, I don't, you can't use a high quality brush. I want this cheap brush because a cheap brush uh, makes streaks and streaks are our friends. Okay, enough of that. Let's get back to the painting and I'm going to start with phthalo blue on very unusual little phthalo goes a long way you probably if you've painted for any length of time at all you know that in fact it's so true that uh, some students are, again are just afraid of, of phthalo because they've had bad experience with it well no 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 you don't have to be afraid oh you know what I just realized the phthalo I'm using right here I believe Nah, don't know if that's all for me. Hang on. The phthalo, I want to see, is it? No, it's good. It's good stuff. Okay. Sometimes, and by the way, as you know, I'm not against using student-grade uh, products. As long as they're light fast, you do have to watch out for that. Don't use anything that's not light fast. That's my opinion. Um, and while you're watching this video, of course, my opinions are correct. <laughs> When you move on to your next video, you can take or leave my opinions. Anyway, um, student grade is okay, but you just have to be aware and make adjustments. Like if you use a student grade paint, you're going to need to use more of it, probably because it has a much lower uh, pigment content. But this is a good... It, when I first put it up there, I thought, man, that seems like a weak phthalo, but it's okay. It's a, it is a good brand. What was it? Richardson? Um, forgive me. Yeah, Richardson Oil, very very good brand, um, like it, just fine. But while I've got phthalo on my brushes, I'm going to go ahead and uh, do it a little bit down here. Now, once again, I begin. I've been teaching for two weeks, so I'm so keenly aware of how students paint. And and forgive me, I'm gonna I'm gonna mo I, 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 forgive me my almost almost mocking spirit, but here's a line of shadow. Here's the way a student paints. First of all, stick out your tongue. Are, are you with me? Oh, that's horrible. Absolutely atrocious. No, you don't paint that way. You make all your edges until the very last. Final edit until the final edit of the painting process. That means if the if the process if this painting is 15 layers deep, the first 14 layers are all soft edges. That's a slight exaggeration, but if you aim if you make that your ideal, you'll be you'll be much 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 better off. And again, I've been watching students paint for two weeks. I bless you. I hope some of you are watching, but you know I'm telling the truth. Left to their own devices, students will 
I'm, I'm kidding about the stick out your tongue part, but I'm not kidding about the hyper control tight edge. Oh my goodness, over and over and over and over and over again. I keep saying, no, 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 loose edges, loose edges, loose edges, and the students keep hanging. No, no, tight edges, tight edges, tight edges. So I'm gonna just keep saying it. There are a whole bunch of reasons why loose edges are better than tight. I don't even want to, I don't have the energy at the moment to get into it. Um, if you watch me often enough, you'll hear me go off on, you'll hear, you know, lecture number 325. Oh, well, there he goes again, talking about why loose edges are better. So if you want to know why and you, you just keep following me, I'll come around. I, again, I just, I get so tired of saying the same things over and over sometimes that, it, that I don't want to say it. I don't want to give that lecture again. I've given it too many times already. Okay. Now, let me talk about something else here. Speaking of speaking of being loose, oh my goodness. I, I say, uh, as a regular matter of course, I say this frequently, that in, that in all of the underpainting stages, which of course in my painting, in my technique is roughly 12 to 15 layers. <laughs> in all of my underpainting phases, um, the goal is to create, one of the goals, one of the chief ways to understand the underpainting process is you want to create, I want, we want to create sufficient chaos, enough chaos on the canvas so that we have lots to respond to in the overpainting stage. And again, most people don't use the term overpainting, but I use it because it, 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 it is so, um, it, uh, because in my painting technique, overpainting and underpainting are so distinct and important that I just go ahead and use that, use that term, overpainting. So in the underpainting process stages, maybe up to 14 of them, perhaps even more sometimes, I'm, I'm not being highly technical here, but roughly 12 to 14 is average, that you want to create chaos, okay, so, right? You with me so far? Therefore, in the underpainting stage, stages, all 14 of them, say, or a dozen of them, in the underpainting stages, not only is it okay, that is to say, admissible, okay, for you to have drawing mistakes, errors, screw-ups, <laughs> lines in the wrong place. Now, you know, you have to kind of take all this on advisement to a degree. Because as you probably know, I'm very serious about uh, being accurate in my drawings. I don't want to be erroneous in... in uh, wrong. Okay, but in the underpainting stages, it's not only okay for some of your lines to be misplaced, it's actually to your advantage. If the, now, that's good because I've got, I, in the few minutes that we were gone and I was getting ready to switch to oils, I discovered several little mistakes here. One is in the scoreboard right here. Um, I could bring you over here and let you see. There's a great big black area here that I think is probably an electronic scoreboard where all the numbers show up. And I've got that completely missing. I've made all these smaller things too big and they've crowded out. And I, I, do, think a, I do think that a Durham Bulls fan could look at this scoreboard and go, that ain't right. So I'm going to fix that. For instance, let me just make it, show you the kind of adjustments I'm going to make. Um, This pencil dead. So basically, all these symbols need to be smaller. Square, square, circle, and then green board right here. I'm going to scrunch it a little bit. See, so what I had here, I'm now redrawn here. This circle here is now over here. This square here. Whoop, whoop, whoop. Sorry, 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 sorry. I missed you. There we go. So I'm redrawing. This, what was a large white square here is now being moved over here. This circle is now going to appear about here. This white rectangle is now being reduced to that. So 
I'm making all these and then going the other way, this is too big, and this is too big, and this is too big, so that my big green board now is going to be roughly here, where a big blackboard, big electronic board. So, okay, so here's what I want to point out to you. So you see, this is just classic. How many mistakes, quote unquote, I made in the underpainting step? Same thing here, shrunk down, Sm made smaller, smaller, but adding a whole new thing here. This whiteboard, this what is light colored here is being scrunched way over even a little bit more. Here's what I want you to understand. So what do I do with all these erroneous mistake marks, like this circle, this, and so on? What do I do with them? The answer is nothing until the final edit, or at least the last two layers, which is fuzz and then final edit. Because it turns out that all these misplaced objects, it's the same way, by the way, it's the same like, what, what am I going to do with this great big drip that's running right through the middle of the infield? I'm going to use that. I'm going to play with it. I'm going to cover up most of it in the final edit. Most of it. Not all of it, because I'm going to use it. What I'm going to do with this, with this random abstract orange shape right here? The answer is, I don't know, but I'm going to use it. I'm going to use it. All, all of this stuff in here, it's all going to be come part of the final painting, but it'll be pushed back in the final edit but I'll still let little bits and pieces peek through, and that's what makes my painting beautiful, is in fact not so much what I do on purpose, it's the things that happen by accident, is what makes my paintings particularly attractive. Okay, let me continue now with more glazes. I just did phthalo blue over a whole bunch. Now I'm going to come back and do, I've got some permanent orange and some Indian yellow on my brushes. Whoa, hang on. My painting is kind of walking away here. Hang on just a second. A little bit of trouble. Try to fix this. There we go. Okay. Um, and I mentioned permanent orange. I don't even know what color that is. I looked at the pigments a few minutes ago and it was, I forget, not even gonna bother. Yeah, a naphthol crimson was one of them. Um, I strongly urge you, my student friends, uh, not, to, not to try to take notes, colors that your favorite teacher mixes together to get this and that color. I strongly recommend that you simply learn to paint by eye. Don't learn to paint by recipe. Every once in a while, a little recipe doesn't hurt. But that should not be the rule. That should be the exception, I believe, in your painting. Um, so here, of course, I'm doing um, yellow-orange on top of the phthalo blue that was already there. So it's picking up that phthalo blue and actually creating kind of a green color, which I'm not crazy about. As I like to say, witness my distress. <laughs> In other words, there ain't any. No, I'm, not, I'm not distressed, I'm just not finished, that's all. Uh, I'm gonna clean, give these brushes a, a rub, get, get some of the paint out of them. There we go. And I'm going to anti-green some of this sky. Right up here, I said I just a minute ago, I, I, I've created kind of a green soup by mixing phthalo and orange, two greens. And I'm gonna anti-green it because I've got red, in this case, permanent rose on my brushes. Come up here and anti-green some of that. Now, do I want red somewhere else besides just a random red? That was. That was crazy, wasn't it? Yeah, I want some red down here. So by mixing this uh, permanent rose with the phthalo blue that I pushed it, just put down here a few minutes ago, of course, I'm making this considerably more purple, which I am liking. Now, I'm gonna, actually gonna put purple on my brushes. 
this is a classic down here. I want both of these corners, definitely, I want them both vignetted. Turning the word vignette into a verb. I'm not sure that it is a verb, but you know what I mean. Vignette to vignette to fade out a corner. Same thing up here. And it's, it's, I've got a perfect excuse for putting purple up in, in the sky up here because this is the darkest part of the sky. The sun is setting to our left. So I, I achieve two things. One is I achieve a, a greater realism in the sky going from light to dark. And at the same time, I achieve a darkened corner up there, which helps. Now, down here in these two lower corners, I can't use purple because it's already very purple. Let's go ahead and do that. So I'm going to use a raw umber. The ugliest color. <laughs> oh, it's horrible. That's funny. I love raw umber. But it is a, it's like mud in a tube. And uh, I'm using it to kill color, so to speak. By the way, the same thing goes for the, the old professorial don't use black. I said that for years until I realized one day, wait, that's not right. What it should be is don't misuse black. Professors say don't use black because black kills color, right? Duh. But listen, there are some times that colors need killing. I said that one time in a class. <laughs> I said, because sometimes there are colors that need killing. And one student said, which ones? <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> I don't mean <laughs> in the universe there are some colors that ought to be killed. No, 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 no. What I mean... Sometimes on your painting, this spot, that spot, this area, that area, this little bit, that little bit, ought to be toned down. You want less chroma. Sorry, I'm yelling in my microphone right now because I'm leaning over. Yeah, so, some, so, so it's okay to use black as long as you understand that black kills color. As long as you understand that. Now have at it. Go ahead. Use black all you want. And, and uh, there are times, believe me. So all those real, I don't know, there's a category of like super simple truisms that aren't true <laughs> that, 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 that artists have used anyway, that's one of them don't use black that's just a truism that's not true okay ah yeah up here to see this do you see that building right there it's too green right so I'm gonna anti green that I'm gonna pick up again some permanent rows and I already had uh, some raw umber, color killer, raw umber on my brush, brushes, so that worked very well. Now that building is just about the, the, the shade, the, the value that I want, and, uh, and the color that I want too. Uh, blah, blah, blah. Okay, while I'm here then, let me, let's go back to this big scoreboard that I read through. There we go. That will be very easy to fix now when I come into the final stages of that. Is there anything else in here that really need, yeah, a little bit ultramarine. You can, you can get, um, you can do some, some detail, quote unquote detail, in the glazing stages. Uh, just be very careful not to get too tight. This is a loose, very loose step of the process. Okay, is there anything else I want? Any more color? I haven't done this anything in this field yet. And I think these brushes, I'm just going to set them. I'm going to clean those up later this afternoon. They'll be okay for a while. Um, no good. I still have these two, two brushes are clean. What color do I want in that field? I don't know. I'm going to pick up a tiny bit of viridian green. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um... If you've seen my, uh, my tour, I've done several videos over the years where I give you a tour of my palette. I think one of them is called, one of my videos 
it, and it, it's actually produced a not not a live video, but you know had a little bit of editing. One of my videos is called "Not Limited Palette." There are a lot of videos out there about limited palette. Blah 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 blah. Yeah 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 yeah. I live and lived and breathed in limited palette for decades. So it was okay. It was a good phase to go through. But now I don't work with a limited palette usually, even though it's still fun just for fun. But Again, that's kind of another art professor truism. You should use a limited palette. Oh, good grief. That's just a, that's just a mythology gone to seed. No, it's perfectly good to use a complex palette. Perfectly good. Anyway, in my tour, I tell you that why I, uh, that I'm less particular about green. I don't care about greens. <laughs> that is to say, I use greens, but I don't care which ones. Sat green, terra verde, viridian, phthalo green, um, oh, magenta, uh, no, 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 manganese green, is that it? Anyway, um, that's just me. I don't have strong opinions on the color green at all. Use whatever, I want to say whatever the heck green you want to use, use it. And the reason I'm not fussy is because almost all my greens are heavily mixed with uh, other colors to create the green that I want. So I don't I don't rely on green out of the box, so to speak. Very rarely use, very rarely do I use green out of the box. My greens are almost always concocted. Of, that was the exception right there. Where I did use out of the two viridian. Again, that's because I'm it's still in the oil glaze stage. A little bit later here and I won't be you know, when I use when I finish this with green, it'll be mixed colors. Okay, how are we doing? How are we doing? <laughs> I'm asking you. <laughs> I think we're doing okay. I'm using a little viridian here. That's green. Um, I am going to do this first of all. I am going to clean these brushes because I don't want to use them again. Um, Listen to my terminology, uh, and again, I, I explained this in my recent art classes. What to call this phase? What do I call this stage? Do I call it an oil glaze, which I think technically is what it is, because it's one layer of glaze over the entire canvas. But it's one layer of glaze made up of several different colors, so that confuses some people. I think, because I think some people think a glaze equals one color. Not according to me. If that's the way you feel about it, that's fine. But according to me, uh, one, one glaze can be several colors. So call it whichever you want, a glaze or several glazes. But the point is, it's several different colors. Now, I'm going to go ahead and do some ragging right here. Anything that I want, the, the, the main thing I want, I find finding right now I want lighter is the sky, so it's coming here, lightening the sky, and I'm going to return in just a minute then, this building a little bit lighter too, I'm going to come back in just a minute and um, do more glazes. Uh, especially in the sky, I want, I want that to be uh, cooler, uh, warmer, not cooler, warmer. <laughs> Sometimes I'm really in my painting brain and my, my painting brain and my talking brain don't always function at the same time extremely well. Okay, back to some orange and Indian yellow. I love Indian, Indian yellow, far and away my favorite, my favorite uh, yellow because it's very transparent. But you have to be careful because it looks very mustardy. It doesn't look very intense when it's on your palette, but when it's made transparent, it's extremely intense and surprisingly cool. I talked about that a little while ago this this afternoon about how all yellows when spread out in a transparent fashion, all yellows become cooler as they are thinned out. That's a really good trick to remember. All yellows become cooler 
as they are made transparent. So keep that in mind. Anytime you're doing a yellow glaze, you want it a lot warmer on your palette than, than it's going to look on your, on your canvas. It's one of the perspicacities, one of the, one of the um, interesting dynamics of a painting in a in transparent color as opposed to the tradition that most of us, most of you grew up with, uh, you know, opposite to what the way I paint is, is opaque color. Okay, so my glaze is done. Yahoo! What next? Well, here we go. I have modified my process in the last little while. Uh, I used to, at this point, I used to do one of two things. Drawing with a dark transparent paint with a, with a small brush like this, or drawing with a pencil. If I did pencils, then I'd follow up with brush. If I did brush, I'd follow up with, with pencils. Get it? I would do both. But I am, of course, always evolving here. And I have a very particular issue. Oh, you know what? <laughs> Hang on, let me interrupt myself. I have a very particular issue with this painting. And that is that some of the drawing here and there and here and there, this drawing is not. I forgot to I forgot to glaze this stuff. It's a very important, as you can see, very important color issue there. Um, I uh, so that there are several points at which this drawing is not satisfactorily accurate. Therefore, I might have to, again, leave my normal order of things to fix the drawing. And again, as I like to say, witness my distress. Goofy, goofy smiling face. I'm not distressed. And I say that to encourage you not to be distressed either. Because we're just not done. That's all the painting. The old, the old, maybe it's a Yogi Bear, I can't remember. The old baseball adage, though, it ain't over till it's over. That's the way real painting is. You're not done until you're done. And until you're done, you're not done. <laughs> until you're done with the last layer, the painting is not finished. So you don't have to, it, the painting does not have to, so to speak, walk on all fours before it's finished. Not till it has all four legs do you ask it to produce the behavior of a four-legged painting using an analogous weird language. Um, So lately what I've been doing at this point then is doing my fuzz layer, my glow layer, and then pencils. Um, and I, hang on, bear with me just for a minute here while I, while I think this through. I'm spending a lot of time thinking, aren't I? If I do dark details in oil, the oil will be very wet. Those dark lines will be very wet, which will affect the way my glow, my fuzz layer, because the fuzz layer will pick up a lot of that darkness and become dirtier. That's okay. I usually just work with it. I don't try to avoid it. I just make it work to my advantage. On the other hand, I could do drawings in pencils, and it won't pick up. But if I do the fuzz layer right now, yep, that's what I'm going to do. Sorry that took so long. So here's what I'm doing. Again, I'm throwing myself a little curve. I'm doing, doing something slightly different from my norm, from the normal. So there are still drawing inaccuracies in this painting, and I hope to fix those. Uh, later 
in the painting process. You with me? Let me turn that music if I'm afraid you can hear it. I'll get in trouble. I'm still thinking. <laughs> Let me take a rag and I'm going to make these player smudges a little bit whiter. Um, so the fuzz layer, let me describe for those of you who might be new. You old timers, you know exactly what the fuzz layer is and you're ready for it. Those of you who don't know what I'm talking about, you don't know what I'm talking about. <laughs> so let me describe it. This is a fairly new development in my painting process, the last two years, where I come in and intentionally create a lot of soft edges. Anything that glows, in this case the sky, and anything the sun is hitting with great directness, that, that's glow, anything that glows, atmosphere, anything that um, is not the right local color, that is roses, red, violets, or blue, that's local color. That's what artists call it. Local means realistic color. If there's anything in here, and there is, for instance, uh, large parts of this building right here need to be orange brick, and there's, it's, not, it's not reflected in what's here right now, so I need to fix that. Um, what else? Some lighter green. This this green's a little too dark in here. So I want to do that in the fuzz layer. Like green here, green here, here. Um, soft edges. Translucent. That's the number one, the, the, no, one, one of two characteristics. Soft, very, very, very soft edges. Messy edges. And translucent. That means, you know what that means. Think about it and you know what it means. I'm not going to define it for you. Um, now I just have to decide where to start. I guess it's pretty obvious. It is, I'm going to start with the sky. For two reasons. One, it needs, it needs some color correcting. And of course it's glowing. So two of those characteristics, color correcting and making it glow. I, I, I uh, started the, the glow layer, at, ironically, I know the exact date, it was July 4th of 2016. I won't, I won't give you the blow by blow, I won't play about how that happened, but I, happened to, I was painting downtown. Uh, and I wondered for a long time if this glow layer was a permanent part of my vocabulary or just a passing phase. And in fact, it seems actually to be growing in importance rather than shrinking, rather than diminishing, at least at the moment. So. I won't speak for what I'll be doing in a year or two years from now. Hopefully I'll be a much better painter two years from now and much of what I do today will, will shift. Um, but I am discovering that this glow layer is perfect for color correcting is the best word. If I save my color correction till the last final edit, it's going to be minutes and minutes cumulatively than perhaps even hours of correcting color. Whereas if you'll see in just a minute, I can color correct in the fuzz layer in a matter of seconds. Okay, let's get, whoops, let's get started though. For the first time, I'm putting out on my palette titanium white. See, there's no white there. This is Naples yellow, which is a very, very opaque and pale color. And of course, I haven't used any of that. So. Let me point out, again, just to make sure you understand me and my technique. Every color on this canvas, as it is right now, is transparent. Every color, now there's white opaque paint, you understand? I'm calling white not a color, right? So there was layers of white, uh, 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 acrylic white, but all the color on the canvas is transparent, and that explains why the painting has such, I'll speak for myself because you're not here to say it, why the painting has such a beautiful glow right now is because all the colors are transparent. And color transparency beats the heck out of opaque any day of the week. Okay, so now, titanium. Oh, I always, let me explain this again. <laughs> yeah, forgive me. I always use alkyd. Alkyd titanium because it's a fast dry titanium and I have not got all day. I'm doing this for a living. If I 
if I finish this painting this evening, I, you bet your something, <laughs> bet your booty. Where did that come from? <laughs> Is that Rowan and Martin's laughing in the '60s? Sweet your bet your sweet bippy or something. I don't remember. <laughs> I'm showing my age here all of a sudden. Anyway, um, if I finish this tonight, I will deliver it tomorrow. I don't have two weeks to wait for the titanium white to dry, which it could easily do. Hello, Susan. Oh, yes, yeah, I've just finished the glaze, Susan. Glad you asked. If you're just joining me, just finished the glaze, and I'm about to do the... Um, about to do the fuzz layer, the glow layer. Same thing, fuzz, glow, translucent layer, the messy layer, I call it sometimes. So, yes, yeah, just starting. And I've decided today to start with, I need to move some of my equipment out of the way a little bit. I've decided today to start with uh, the sky in the, the glow layer. I described this to my students in the last couple of weeks. This glow, how soft, when I say soft edges, listen to this. When I say soft edges, how soft do I mean? Now, I don't know if this will translate. I hope it will. If you have a can, a traditional can of spray paint, you with me? And you're holding the can this far away from the surface, you're going to get a, a spread zone about this big. And that's roughly how soft I want. In other words, see, look at What's my brush doing way down here? I'm painting this, but my brush is way down here. Now, it's only, it's a faint mark of way on there, of course. But that, that's what I mean by a soft mark. Again, once again, I, as, I, as I led my students in this in the last couple weeks, I would say soft edges, soft edges, and I come and find them, you know, right. Now, of course, you know, here I am ranting and raving, and I say this to every time I have a student. I want to make sure, every time I'm teaching somebody, I want to make sure that you guys understand me, too. Um, all my opinions are absolutely correct, infallible, <laughs> inviolable, inarguable, <laughs> until you move on to somebody else's video, right? So, I understand. There's, there's a thousand different ways to skin this cat, so to speak. So, you just let me let me just thunder forth and tell you my opinions without feeling like I have to back up and defend myself every five minutes and say, "Of course, this is my opinion. This is my opinion." Speaking of my opinion, there, there is one comment that I saw. I haven't had a chance to respond to it yet. And if you if you happen to be listening to me, uh, I forget what the name was, but there was somebody commented on my mud video. I have a, a 10, 11 minute video called. Uh, avoiding mud, and I got the most fascinating comment back from someone the other day, and uh, they, they said, well, this is all very interesting, but this has nothing to do with, art, with what artists mean when they say mud, and he proceeded to say that what artists really mean when they talk about mud is when you're painting wet and wet, and the two colors mix together and create mud, and I, 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 I am going to respond, respond to him, but to me, this is a clear example of a, of, of a sociological or anthropological study. The person who made this comment sounded very intelligent, sounded, in fact, like an art professor. But uh, I wasn't born yesterday. I've been an artist for 50 years, and I've lived basically in three parts of the country, Midwest, Texas, and North Carolina. And all my life, I've never, ever heard mud. I've heard mud discussed ad infinitum. I've never heard it defined in that way. So what is happening there, is, and I don't think the person is wrong, it turns out there are probably regionalisms. There are different parts of the world, in fact, where, like maybe California, maybe everybody in California thinks that mud is what he described, or maybe Australia, or maybe Austria. There's somewhere in the world where people think what he thought, which I think is extremely fascinating. There's no question in my mind that I'm correct. <laughs> but there's no question in my mind that in his world, he's correct too. I mean, he sounded like an intelligent person. Now, he could just be, I don't know, you know, a hack, but he didn't sound like a hack. But fascinating. So anyway, all that goes to say, all of my opinions are correct. <laughs> as long as you're watching my video. Then when you go on and watch somebody else's video, their opinions can be correct. Fair enough? <laughs> 
So again, right now I'm just doing the, the softness of the sky, which is also, a, as you can see, doubles. I, 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 should, I could also call it the atmospheric, the atmosphere layer. I just pushed that building back a good bit. And do the same thing to this one while I'm at it, I believe. Yep. Yeah. Okay, I think I'm done with the sky. Let me come down just part way then in the painting. Let's do some of this orange, you know, sun, evening sun hitting bricks color. So, uh, warm yellow orange. And again, for the first time in the painting process, I'm actually putting opaque color on the canvas. I'm going to get my microphone back here where you can hear me a little bit better. And I'm sorry, I'm missing most of your comments. I do very much look forward to looking them up later. But um, my camera, my, my face is pointed the opposite way. Sorry about that today from my monitor. Okay, so this building over here has a whole bunch of real warm orange hitting the sunlight, hitting Right? So why am I scribbling? Because anything that you want to appear as if it is glowing, candle, light bulb, headlights, taillights, traffic lights, uh, neon line, neon signs, but also anything that's glowing, that means strong sun hitting a light object, that's glowing. So this wall, this red brick wall, it's not red, orange, yellow, light brick wall hitting, being hit. Um, I want it to look as though the sun is just exploding off that wall. Therefore, I make, I'm making the glow first. Here, again, rule of thumb. Anytime you want to paint something that's glowing, this wall, you paint the glow first, and then you paint the object second. Let me give the most obvious example. How do you paint a candle? Do you paint the flame real carefully? and then paint the glow around the flame? Not in my opinion. You paint the glow first, then you paint the flame on top of the glow. Just for what it's worth. Okay, now, down here again. Here's another wall. Red, orange, orange brick being smashed by the bright, intense setting sun. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna make it well, oh, 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 this, this, that sound reminds me. Let me point out something else. Now, this goes back to the subject of brush strokes. Brush strokes. The essence of good painting is making interesting marks. The essence of interestingness is variety. The antithesis of interesting marks is ergonomic strokes. So you'll notice when I'm doing this glow, I'm not going like this. First of all, I'm not holding the brush this way, but it's not going like this. I'm not going to touch the painting because it would ruin it. I'm not, I'm, do you see? No, 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 no. It's, it's like this. There you go. That's very important. This is ugly. When you make a mark like that, you're not doing it because you're thinking like an artist. You're doing it because you're not thinking at all. You are, in fact, just moving your hand in its most natural motion. That's When you do that kind of motion, that's why you're doing it, because it comes natural, not because it looks good. So I, I can do it very quickly because I've trained my hands, and you can too, to make interesting marks very quickly. See all that kind of stuff? But um, do not do the windshield wiper or the fly whisper. <laughs> I'm trying to make up names here. <laughs> the fly flicker. No, 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 none of that stuff. Okay, again, more orange stuff down here. Glow, 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 glow. So I want it to just look like the sun is just exploding off these, in this case, orange walls. The other thing that this kind, this, this layer, this stage of the painting process, the other thing that it's doing for me, of course, is creating a lot of soft edges. One of the laws, breakable laws of painting it's almost impossible for a painting to have too many soft edges. It's not only possible, it's entirely likely <laughs> that most paintings have too many hard edges. Okay, back to now the shady side of 
of the, these buildings. Where I, now what I'm doing is not so much glow as it is local color. That is to say, there's a, supposed to be a bunch of, in shade, that, that same brick color, but in shade over here. And um, it's not here, so I'm going to really quickly get my correct local color happening there. There. See, it just took a few seconds to do orange, 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 brown, here, 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 and here. And now that, that building is essentially the correct color. I'll do more of that here in just a minute. Um, anything else? Yeah, a little bit of the uh, the infield of dirt, the orange dirt here. Let me correct this color. Do you understand? Like this is this is the 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 base paths and so forth are too green in here. So I need to give them the correct color. And it's much quicker. And you notice how, again, how loose I'm being, how messy I'm being, right? Whew. There's a reason for that. That is not an accident. That is not a mistake. That is very, very, very intentional. But look, it's it's achieved. I've achieved the color correction in just a matter of seconds. Whereas if I were to save that color correction till the final edit layer, that would have taken minutes and minutes and minutes to do that. Ah, my bull needs some color correction. I'm just basically fuzzing in some brown there. And again, there's a, a render brick building over here that was just a little bit of fuzz. I can, I can uh, create the, the correct color over here for that red brick building. Perfect. In fact, I like this reddish stuff I've just mixed up. I like it so well. I'm going to add some of it over here. Going around the side of the canvas, of course. I like this little reddish brown I've got on my brush right now. I think I'm just about maybe some people's heads, a little bit of flesh tone in the crowd. A bit. There we go. Yeah. Okay. Um, put those brushes down so I don't have to waste your time cleaning brushes. Slightly smaller now. There we go. The, the infield. So again, the, I think the last major thing I need to do in the color correction stage is fix the color of the infield. And I do want to tell you what color green I have here because it's a weird one. Permanent green light. Wow, there's a wide, evidently there's a wide, wide range of opinion as to what permanent green light looks like. This is the opinion of the Michael Harding Company. I like Michael's paintings, paints very much, but he's he's in the minority as to what he thinks permanent green. I like his color quite a bit, but it's very unusual. I'm going to mix it with a cad imitation cad yellow because I know that's going to give me a very intense chartreuse color, which indeed it has. Now I just have one problem with that: those brushes are a little too. Damn. So uh, basically this glow layer, the entire thing is done with quite dry brushes. In fact, I'm going to eliminate that pile of paint right there and mix, mix it fresh. The brushes are quite dry. I do not want to be going into the, um, in other words, no liquid and not, not much paint. I don't want to be going into the um, final stages of this painting with a sopping wet canvas. If it, I mean, if I did, of course, I could quit and come back a couple hours later, but I don't want to do that if, if I can handle it. So here again, I'm color correcting, making corrections, and it's okay if this, not only okay, 
it's good if the green spills out of its bounds. And that's evidently one of the hardest things for students to, to, to grasp is, is this concept of soft edges. Which I think are so important and, and, and make the painting so much more dynamic. Um, so if you're a student, I beg of you to learn the magic um, man, of soft, soft, soft edges. Again, if I were to, this is what I'm just discovering in recent weeks that in this this fuzz layer it's a great time to make to to make color corrections because it, I can do it so quickly let's take for instance like this this trapezoid right here is supposed to be green grass let me zoom you in here just for a minute hang on so you can see this Okay, so this trapezoid is supposed to be a bank of green grass going up at an angle. It looks nice, it's not green enough. So I just simply come in here, now it's the right color. And I, I know the way I did I, I say to my students, don't sit there like you knew I was going to do that. I just freaked you out of your minds, because you most of you would have gone, right? So let's do it again. This, here's a bank of bushes right here. Let's do that again. Color correction. My brushes went from here to here, coloring that. And I stand by my decision. <laughs> I am, till you watch your next video, doggone it, I am right. <laughs> this is how you should paint. <laughs> till you watch your next video, of course. Okay, same thing. Now this is a darker green. These are this is not grass. This is bushes. So I'm going to give them the right color. Here we go. Ready? Done. Uh, okay, I can't I can't help giving some of this lecture that I give all the time. Why 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 do I have green now that uh, comes all the way up here and it's one of the reasons. One of there's several, but one of the main reasons is this. It's, it is one of the breakable laws of painting. The name of the book that I'm working on, I need a miracle in my life to, to, for this thing to get finished. Let me just continue. The breakable laws of painting. Yes, there are laws. Anybody who tells you otherwise is either a lousy artist or they're playing semantic games. There are a lot of lousy artists that say, you know, and a lot of them are professors, by the way, Sorry to be a little bit mean and honest, but let me just correct your view of the art world. I'll say this gently. Most artists, most professor, art professors, most, not all by any means, not your favorite one, but most art professors, they are art professors because they can't make it in the world as artists. So, kind of take that you know, take what they say on advisement. Some of them are very good. Tragically, not all of them are. Okay, so anyway, there you go. I want, just want to correct your view of the cosmos a little bit there. Um, and why was I talking about professors? For some good reason. I just now got off on a tangent and forgot what I was going to say. Oh, I know. Uh, yeah, some, some professors say there aren't any art rules. What most people mean, in fact, my friend who doesn't know me, Mark Carter, I think he's one of those who says there aren't any rules. I, I take it that people say that they're simply not a linguist. That's that's all. They might be a fantastic artist, but they're not real. They're not real sophisticated in their use of language. Their gifting is not philology, philology philological. Okay, I'm gonna let you look that one up. Philological. Um, what they usually say, what Mark Carter says, I think he says this, there aren't any rules. You tell me what, a, you give me a rule and I'll show you a painting that breaks it. Check. I agree with him completely. 
I don't agree with what he said, but I agree. Of course, that's why they're called breakable laws of being. Every law can be broken if it's broken in the right way, for the right reason, at the right time, to the right degree. With intelligence, every law can be broken. But if you don't know what the laws are, you're probably just screwing up. Okay, so here's one of the, the laws. Breakable laws of painting. Can be broken, but it's still a law. The human eye gets a kick out of seeing. Let's call, let's call this the object, this green plane of grass. I'll use it as an example. The human eye gets a kick out of seeing little bits of the object that is spilled into the background and little bits of the background that's spilled into the object. We get a kick out of it. And I could go on and on and on and explain to you even more degree why that is the case, but I'm not going I'm just gonna leave it at that for right now. Um, I need to do one more thing now that I and then I'm standing ahead a few seconds to look at my painting. Um, this all this green in here is just a little bit too dark. So I'm going to come back and um, do the glow layer in this green. And again, I, I, the, the, I don't mind taking this time because, in my opinion, this, this part of the painting is, first of all, it's large, but it, it is just so, so critical, so important to the overall feel. And uh, right now, it's darker. Now, of course, I could fix that. And of course, I can fix it in the final edit layer. But if I do, it'll take me quite a bit of time. Whereas I can fix it right now. I'm looking at my watercolor sketch. Let me show you again what, I, what I'm looking at over here. I've got two things for my reference. One is the photo that I'm looking at quite a bit. And one is my watercolor sketch that I sent to my client. You can tell I'm using the color from this way more than the color from this. But I'm using the details from this more than this. But see the color of the field in there? Thanks, Coffee Cat. Appreciate it. So that's, that's what I, I want to reflect. See, it's a little bit too dark here on my painting right now. So I've just mixed up a lighter version of that. By the way, um, you don't have to paint with two hands. You're just smart if you do. <laughs> Um, I used to be nicer about that. I used to be much more gentle. I'm less gentle than I used to be. I trained myself to paint with two hands, and you can too. I didn't start till I was about 50 years old. God help me, I should have started when I was 11. No, 7. Um, be that as a better late than never. Um, um, it's easier to do this glow fuzz thing with two hands because it's scary enough with one, two hands. It's even more scary with one hand. It took me a, it's, it's still, I'm, I'm still not quite there. I'm still always a little bit nervous when I do this because it looks forever much like I am just ruining the painting, doesn't it? But I've learned that I'm not. I've learned to try. I've done it enough times now. Like, no, you just be patient. You just watch what's going to happen. Okay, so now I just color corrected, actually values corrected that, that field. Now that I've done that, I need to color correct the, the baselines. And then I think I'm done with the color with the, uh, I think I'm done with the fuzz layer, the glow layer, the translucent local color layer. As soon as I finish with the, the, the the orange of the base lines. You know what I mean. <laughs> okay, here we go. Now, I hope some of you are saying, well, wait a minute. You just finished putting green, painting all sloppy and putting green on top of the brown. Now you're doing brown and making brown on top of the green. Bingo, check. Great, glad you noticed. Correct, absolutely right. That is what you're supposed to do. We like to see little bits of the object. Right now, my object is this orange baseline. We like to see little bits of the baseline that's escaped into the grass. A little bit of grass has escaped into the baseline. Now, you can ask me, why? What do you mean? I've never heard that before. By the way, I don't teach things that I've heard before very much. Um, I mean, I, I, I absorb everything from everybody I can. But much, very much of what I teach is because I am a pioneer. I can't help it. Didn't try. Don't try to be a pioneer. It just happens. Um, I'm, I'm a visual pioneer. I'm not a, 
I'm not an encyclopedist. I don't record what other people have taught and repeat that. No, I, I tell you what I know because of my eyes, what my eyes tell me. There was somebody, again, never mind, no. there was somebody else who said something funny several months ago. I, know, I think they said, oh, anyway, it doesn't matter what they said, but it was funny because they thought that I was like parroting what I had heard some professor or art teacher say sometime. And I wasn't at all. I was speaking visual realities. I, most of what I, the reason I do what I do is because of how it looks, not because I heard it somewhere in class. That's, it sounds kind of arrogant, forgive me, but that's just, so you know what, where to pigeonhole me, okay? Okay, gang, I am finally, what a mess. What a glorious mess this painting is right now. Uh, it is much, much, much softer than it was a few minutes ago, but of course I'm not done yet. But I do like the way it's going, and the colors, the, the overall color palette is so much closer and didn't take very long. Got it? Okie doke. I'm going to take a little break right here. Um, almost time for me to eat lunch. <laughs> and uh, I'll be back. Let me tell you, that. let me think for a minute. What's the next thing I'm going to do? It's now, it's either draw with small brushes, like, you know, roughly this big. My favorite brushes, by the way, are Filbert's. And my favorite brush company, if maybe you can tell, is the Silver Brush Company. No question, Silver Grand Prix. Uh, they have nice long filbert. So anyway, draw with small brush, kind of like that. Dark, transparent detail. Or either pencil and then brush, or brush and then pencil. And I'm not sure which of those I'm going to do. Um, I still have a fair amount of architecture up here to, to straighten out, to get accurate. It doesn't all need to be quote-unquote accurate, but it needs to be more accurate than it is. Um, and when I come back with both of those, especially drawing with brushes, I want to be careful that I don't obliterate too much of my beautiful fuzz. Does that make sense? All the fuzz that I just did, I don't want to I'm going to tighten up some parts, but I, I don't want to do too much. I want, so I'll just uh, hold that carefully. Okay, I'm still thinking, thinking, thinking what's going to come next. Um, I'm still thinking. I think I'm going to do pencil next. Okay, I think that's settled. Thanks for watching. I'll be back. Back. Thanks for joining me again. Uh, just finished the fuzz layer, and I've decided to do pencils next. And especially this building, which still is in need of quite a lot of... Um, definition. Now, I want you, if you're a student, I want you to try to watch fairly carefully. The way that I draw, and what I mean by that is literally not not the lines. Yes, the lines are left behind, but more than that, I'd like you, if you're a student and wanting to learn and improve, I want you to pay attention to the manner in which I move to make these marks. Let me go back to one of my most common mantras, <laughs> one of my most common statements I say over and over and over again. Uh, the essence of good painting is, yes, in fact, the art of making interesting marks. And especially when it comes to using pencils, which, of course, please do, yes, please understand that using pencils in oil paintings <laughs> by no means is this a, by no means is this a traditional approach to to painting this is this is weird uh, this is weird 
It just happens to be a, a weirdness that I have taken a fancy to. Uh, so yeah, not normal. Not normal at all to paint. I just realized that that's supposed to be a bank of lights up there. So let me get the, the yellow off of that, turn it back to white. There we go. Um, but more than that, I, I want you to notice the, the manner in which, and of course I'm drawing with two hands, of course. You can tell by the way that I'm holding the pencil that I'm not doing it um, with a certain, that I'm not doing it with a certain goal, uh, with a certain style, with a certain manner. In other words, I'm not holding the pencil like this, sticking in my tongue and drawing lines, right? That would be highly inappropriate in my opinion because the essence of good painting the very essential the sin qua non I don't know if I'm saying that right sin qua non <laughs> without which nothing I do know I know what it means the Latin phrase without if you ain't got this you ain't got nothing the sin qua non, the without which nothing of oil painting is making interesting marks. If you're not making interesting marks, your painting is hogly. <laughs> That's worse than ugly. That's hogly. <laughs> and you sure don't want a hogly painting. <laughs> uh, so, can you see that? So that right there, am I zoomed in all the way? No, not quite. So that right there is, that's called a straight line. But if you look at it really closely, it's Right? That's weird. That's the way I draw. And finding these pencils, these two particular pencils, I hate to say this, I'm wondering if this is, these are brand new pencils, I'm wondering if they changed their recipe. Um, they are not behaving quite like normal. They're harder than normal. Boy, I hope they have not, I hope, sincerely hope they have not changed their formula for their pencils. I'm not liking this quite as well. It's from China. Uh, the tolerances are a little more wiggly in China. Not to say anything bad about China or the products that we get from them. <laughs> but if you know anything about products from China, you know that they're they're not they're not given to. I'm sure they can do anything they want, but they don't consider. Precision uh, is not a high value, evidently, most of the time in much of China. <laughs> Close is good enough. This <laughs> seems to be. Anyway, so I hope they haven't changed. That, yeah, this pencil is not working quite like normal. Normally, in uh, when I'm doing pencil on top of um, oil, there, it's it's nice, kind of quite greasy and. You know, like the olden days when you used to lick, stick a pencil in your, on your tongue <laughs> before you drew with it. You know, it was a little bit juicier that way. Um, but alas, this is not being very juicy. Anyway, I'll stop comparing and just try to paint with, try to draw with what I've got. I fear here that I'm going to be boring you to tears if I just keep on 
not all of the drawing needs needs this amount of uh, attention uh, but but uh, these this this building here in particular does so if it's all right with you I'm going to leave let you guys leave me for a little while and, and uh, allow me to draw at least this building in peace and quiet without your company for just a while again partly because I don't you I know you can't see a great deal of what I'm doing and uh, so I don't want to bore you and I don't want to have to force myself to keep on thinking of clever things to say <laughs> I don't want either one of those so I'm going to take a break while I do this more of this pencil work I'll bring you back in shortly okay Thanks for your company. Appreciate it. Hello, friends. Welcome back. I am finished now with the... From Turkish. From Turkey. Fantastic. Welcome aboard. Uh, I'm finished with the pencil layer. And um, as I often say, at the end of the pencil stage layer... Uh, my painting is entirely too pencil-ish. Let me turn down my music a little bit. Way too much pencil. Way, 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 way too much pencil in the painting. Again, not to worry. There's a reason I keep saying this. Some of you need to hear it. Not to worry. The painting's not finished yet. You need to get to the point... Again, somebody needs to hear this. You need to get to the point, some of you students, you need to get to the point where you are comfortable letting the painting be unfinished. Does that make sense? Um, in contrast to that, why wouldn't somebody... Uh, let me tell you exactly what I think is happening many, many times. Um, if you are, in fact nervous about your ability to successfully finish a painting, if you're nervous about your ability to especially render, draw the object, which is the Achilles heel of most student painters. It is bad drawing is what the most common thing to, to um, afflict <laughs> students. And the solution, the way to become a good drawer, by the way, is not by painting, it's by drawing. Um, uh, again, I, I don't want to go down that road too far because I don't want to lose my track of train of thought, but if you want to be a better painter, learn to be a better drawer. And if, in order to do that, you should be doing sketches a lot. You can sketch in paint if you want to. If you don't want to sketch in in pencil and charcoal or pen, is that, and then then sketch in paint. That's okay, but sketches are you know five minute, three minute affairs, fifteen minutes at the most. Uh, anyway, the reason people are uncomfortable with their unfinished painting is because because they're worried that they won't. So they want to. Here's the mistake they make because they're insecure. So they do what I call they rush to judgment. They, they um, try to finish the painting, the parts that they're worried about, again, which is usually the drawing parts. They try to finish the detailed drawings quickly so they can, in a sense, so they can relax and rest and say, Whew, wow, okay, now I can just paint. Does that make sense? And, and as understandable as that impulse is, it's counterproductive. No, you do not want to rush to judgment. Even if you're insecure in your drawing abilities, you want to take your time and allow the, the painting, the image, to emerge little by little by little instead of rushing. So again, now all the way back to... Now, I was saying um, my painting has way too many lines in it, but I'm not, I'm not stressing out because... Uh, because um, because the painting's not finished, that that's all there is to it. I, I'm I'm going to take my time. In the course of the next two layers, 
much, many, <laughs> how, do, how do I put this? Many, in the course of the next two layers, many of those pencil lines will be obliterated, covered up, wiped out. I'm wiping them out right now um, as we speak. One of the nice things about, again, about these pencils, again, I've mentioned it many times, let me do it again, Jumbo Jet Black, manufactured, distributed by Jerry's Artorama. Got it? Jumbo Jet Black, Jerry's Artorama. It's not as greasy as a grease pencil, but a little more greasy than a Conti crayon. For those of you, you artists who know what a Conti crayon is. Um, I like them. I like the, the pencils quite, quite much. They work for me very well. One of the nice things about them is that Again, I'm using liquid now because I'm doing dark, right? Because I'm doing dark, of course, then, then it's transparent, right? All darks are, you always get darks with transparent, light with opaques. So because I'm using darks, I'm doing transparent, which means, again, that I'm using liquid. Don't ask me, how do you buy those, how, where do you buy those transparent paints? No, 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 no. These are not any more transparent than what you buy. They're ordinary oil paints. Some are transparent, some are not. I make them by transparent by mixing liquid with them. That's what makes it transparent. Okay. The good news is that the liquid is, in fact, a solvent for the pencil. In other words, the, the liquid uh, dissolves the pencil, which is wonderful because that means I can, I can rub these brushes against those pencils for just a second and is if I keep on rubbing and rubbing and rubbing they'll completely disappear or if I just rub them a little bit which is what I do most of the time they just they just get diminished cool huh so um, theoretically now I think you know this theoretically at the end of this stage this phase right here this is the next to the last layer this is the penultimate is the <laughs> good old English word. This is the next to the last layer, next to the last stage or phase of the painting process. And um, the last stage, of course, is what I call either call it the final edit or I call it the light opaque highlights even going from highlights all the way to sparkle um, so and that layer also will diminish will diminish some of the uh, pencil lines so that there's two stages here that are going to diminish the pencil lines one of the things I like, one of the things I like about my painting technique, my approach to painting, this crazy, this crazy technique of mine that has just evolved over the years. I did, again, I, did, I didn't set out to be crazy. It just has gotten that way as I, as I just continue to experiment and experiment and experiment. Uh, one of the things I like about it is that each step of the painting process is isolated it isolates a problem so you could call this you you could call this a lazy man's approach to painting because <laughs> i don't have to think about a whole bunch of things all at once i don't have to think about color composition drawing um values texture and everything all at once i just i think i, I think of one problem at a time so what am i thinking about right now I'm thinking about my dark values. I don't need to think about drawing because the drawing's all done. I'm pretty much just following the drawing that's already there. I'm right now. I'm not thinking much about color because the color's all done. I've got one more layer of color, of course, the final layer. But I don't. I'm not focused on color. When I was doing the the pencils a few minutes ago, I didn't. I I didn't have to worry like maybe I'm doing too much pencil. Whoa, I better be careful. I don't want to do too much pencils. I didn't have to think that way. No, just slap it down, man. Just do it. Do it, do it, do it, do it. Stop. Don't second guess. Don't be thinking 
rethinking, double, triple thinking yourself, like, oh man, I hope I'm not messing up. No, no, no. So anyway, that's one of the things I like about my approach is that each step, each phase of the painting process is a distinct step and I only have to pretty much only have to worry about one problem at a time. And at the moment, the only problem I'm, I'm focused on is dark values. Does that make sense? So it's really, really easy in some, in some respects. Easy way to paint. I don't have to think of everything all at once. Okay. I believe I have beaten that horse to death. <laughs> I'll just let it go with that. Again, so nice. Drawing's done, so to speak. The drawing, so to speak, is done. I'm drawing again, but only only focusing on dark zones, on little bits, parts of the of the dark painting, parts of the painting that need to be darker, I should say. It really, really does simplify matters quite a bit. And in the next phase, next stage, which is, theoretically is the last one, although I'll modify that when we get there, but for now, one more stage to go. And in that stage, I won't be worrying about dark areas. Now, let me, let me answer a question. Do, you, do I, someone might say to you, well, do you ever, while you're going through your stages, step 1, 2, 3, 4, 6, 12, 13, 14, do you ever discover you missed something? And the answer is, oh, absolutely, all the time. So what do you do then? Well, then you cheat the system. That's all. That's easy. Yeah, in other words, I can go back and do anything I want. Um, just understand that when I do that, I'm cheating the system. So typically, I want to sort of cover my tracks. <laughs> I, want, I don't want it to be obvious that I, that I have gone back and, and uh, cheated the system. Does that make sense? I, want, I, want, I don't want it to be obvious. So I'll just do it very, 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 very carefully. Usually, it's not not difficult to do that at all. Okay, let me uh, sit down again. I think I'm done with all that up there. I'm all the way down here to the foreground. And uh, let's get the umpire in black here. Another umpire here in black. And one way over here who's still wearing white. I guess that umpire was standing there in his underwear all that time till now. Now he is appropriately dressed in black. And uh, I'm assuming you can see this down here. I'm not doing the, 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 the people in the stands. Uh, trying very careful not to get too careful, not to get too fussy. Just leave it, leave it quite abstract. Now, the way that I think, and again, if, if, if you are an artist, if you're a painter and you want to imitate my technique some, to some degree, and of course many people send me texts and emails and comments and say I'm, you know, I'm, I am doing that, so I'm talking to you. Um, the next stage is by far the most difficult for you experienced painters. Here's why. You experienced painters, when you get to the next stage after this one, the final edit or light opaque highlights, at that point you begin painting in a fairly traditional manner. Um, and what happens then is those of you who paint in a traditional manner, you say, oh, oh, I know how to do this part. And then you take off and cover up way too much area in the final layer. So um, when I'm teaching a class in this, I have two rules in the next phase, the next stage, two 
two guidelines that I give. One is I say no more than 15% of the canvas. And I just tried to do the math. My math didn't work out. But I think, I'm thinking that on a, on a canvas this size, um, uh, a little bit more than that, maybe two pages. Let me see if I've got another piece of, here we go. I'll just pull this one. Maybe, maybe, maybe this much. Mm, not quite. Smaller than that. Should have any opaque paint on it. Now what, the, what that means is when I get to the end of this stage right here, my painting should be 90% finished. I only am going to do 10% of the canvas is going to get any light opaque highlights on it. And I feel like I'm, I'm very much within that range on this painting. Um, little shadows on all my little guys here out on the field. I really had a fun time penciling those guys in in pencil. Nice little nice little blobs. Can you see them there? That just give I'll, of course I'll come back and do a tiny bit uh, in in the final layer, but not much. They're very close to finished right as the way they are right now. Okay, I think I might be done. Close enough. I can always come back and ch cheat, of course, cheat the system and do uh, more of this dark stuff. This is the most common cheat that I have, by the way, is when I get into the final light opaque highlights and then I discover, as I'm going along, I discover something that needs to be darkened. So that, that is far away the most common uh, cheat that I do as I find that I have to or want to come back and add some more darkness. Let me see, now, a little bit here in the, in this famous Durham bowl up here. Okay. I think that'll do. I'm going to take, again, if you don't mind, I'm going to take a real short little break, not very long this time. For one thing, I want to look up, I want to Google, um, I want to do a search for um, Durham Bulls scoreboard. I hope that I'll see this scoreboard um, lit up so I can get a better estimate of what it, what it really looks like. I imagine it's going to have you know, white lights, letters across it, but I, I want to check on it. Okay, so I'll be back in just a few minutes, real quick, right? Thanks for I stage, last phase of this painting. And um, I have one very, very particular task that I need to accomplish. Let me take a break. Whoa! <laughs> but they're, they're not copy I mean they are copyrighted so I can't play them for you okay the thing is J-A-M-E-S-S-C-O-T-T -T. um I have to get this um uh, sign my client is uh there, his home office is in this building up here, and his name is on this sign, J-A-M-E-S-S-C-O-T-T. -S -S oh, I'm going to run out of room. Okay, let me, let me, let me change that here. And that was test number one, so my, my hash marks need to be smaller than that. Let's, let's get that changed, okay? Okay, here we go again. Slightly smaller. J A M E S J Are you able to see this? Am I zoomed in? No, here we go. Scott T T 
Ferrin, F-E-R-R-I-N. I promised my client that the sign would go fit, would be barely legible. F-E-R-R, -R, and then I is skinny, N. There we go. Right. This this would be a good uh, primer, primer, perhaps for some of you about lettering. Let me let me zoom out here so I can talk to you. Lettering in a painting poses a very specific and particular problem. Here's a mistake many times when, when a student is doing a painting and the, there's a sign in the painting. Texaco, you know, gas to Exxon, whatever it may be. They turn off their painting brain far too often and they turn on their penmanship brain and they also they go oh I know how to do this part and they they write out they hold their pen the wrong way and write it out um, bad mistake because then that little bit of the painting doesn't fit all the rest of the painting now this is very small up here so I am going to hold my my brush in the death control grip um, but I'm going to this is one trick. I'm going. Let me let me see if I can bring you in really close. So you can see this even better. Hang on. Excuse excuse the uh, the uh, rough ride here. There we go. Okay. I have the right number of marks. And I'm going to turn negative paint each letter. So the first letter, the first name is James. First letter is J. J. A. I don't have to. I'm not being exact. I'm just being approximate. M. E. J A M E S. So does that make sense? On so a negative painting, those letters. You can probably guess what I'm going to do next. I'm going to come back and doing just barely enough. Here's how legible. Now, this again, this lettering is quite small. So I have to be, it'd be real easy to overdo it. I want it to be so you can't read it at first glance, that the casual observer won't read it. But the intent studier will go, oh, wait a minute. James Scott. Oh, James Scott Farron. That's a very well-known name around here. Does that make sense? So that's sort of, I don't want, I want it to be obscure enough. Why? Because if I make it clear enough that the casual observer can read it, then I've, I have clearly overdone it if the casual observer can read it. So that's sort of my guideline. I, I'm very often, SCO, I call it my barely legible Barely legible. Well, of course, if it were great big, then it'd be easily legible. James Scott, S C O T T. And in fact, what I'm doing right now, even though again, even though I'm sort of breaking the rules and hold, you're doing the death control grip. Are you with me? The 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 uh, ignore that for the moment. What I'm doing, negative painting the letters, is a very very good trick for accomplishing this. This little trick, if you will, instead of painting the letters, do a round bullet, negative paint them. F E R R I and then the final N. Make the bottom of the letter a little more even in. And this negative drawing letters is a is like grade school trick. You know, a, every artist has done it just for fun, just playing around. Now, let me look at that. Yeah, I think by the time I'll tell you what. No, I'm going to let that dry a little while, so that when I come back later. Again, so let me, but let me make make sure you understand. When I do come back later, 
I'm, I'm not going to take a fine brush like this and and very carefully draw each of these letters. That would be way overkill. I'm just just a few dots here and there because that's actually that's actually pretty legible right now. That's about that's about the degree of legibility that I want, but it's not the degree of contrast that I want. I want it a little more punchy. There you go. So that's quick lesson. Let me back you up now to normal view. And now, now let, let's final light opaque highlights or final edit. I use both of those terms interchangeably. And by the way, let me, now that I'm into the last layer, let me, let me contradict myself. In the last month or so, I've actually added another layer after this one. So now the final edit is not actually the final layer anymore. But the new final layer is so subtle, I'll let you watch me, but it's so subtle that it's very easy. And that is broken color. I'll describe that later when I get to it. But just know that I have actually, in the last month or so, added a new phase stage. And it's very simple. It doesn't take long. It's really quick and fun. But there is one more layer after this one. Okay, final uh, light opaque highlights or final edit. Now, I say this all the time, but let me repeat myself again. There are four options for where to start. You ready? Four different places you can start. One is traditional oil painting traditional opaque oil acrylic painting you start with a farthermost furthermost object which in a landscape is always the sky and move forward so option number one sky first option number two start at the focal point <laughs> and work out from there like in the rings of a target start with the bullseye and move up number three start with the lightest brightest whitest thing and then grow slightly darker from there so for me the lightest thing in this painting is going to be the sky right down here, a little bit here, a little bit here, a little bit here. Oh, except for the, the uh, there will be the, 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 the lights on the field, They'll, but those are just spots of color, so spots of light. I don't know if that counts. Maybe it does. Uh, but lightest, brightest, whitest. Third, if there's any large shape that is just not the right color, then you can start there. Now, that, that third option has been greatly diminished in the last month. By the way, I'm now doing the fuzz layer, where I'm, I'm trying to uh, take care of the whole fuzz layer in... Uh, the, uh, the, I'm trying to take care of local color in the fuzz layer. That's option number three, less important now. Option number four, start... Did I do it? S farther, sky, lightest, focal point, or local color. There we go. Those are the four options. Start with the sky, farthest thing. Start with the lightest, brightest, whitest thing. Start with uh, focal point, or start with local color. Um, and I'm thinking, 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 thinking. First of all, I'm not sure what the focal point is. Now, I don't, I don't, I'm not worried about that. I am not worried about that. Our eyes are going very easily from the bull to the field to this corner of the building. Those, those three, uh, and I'm very, I don't, I don't think that's a weakness. I don't, if I could call this a focal point, that would be it. It's a little bit large for a focal point. So if, if I pick one spot, it might be the pitcher, and that's okay. So I could start painting right around the pitcher. <laughs> this time, by the way, I really am saying pitcher. <laughs> you, you veterans of my website, of my uh, channel, will know why that's funny. I usually use the word pitcher when I when I'm ridiculing picture painting. I call it pitcher painting, <laughs> but now I really am doing a pitcher. Anyway, <laughs> okay. Um, I could start by painting around the pitcher and then the grass and go out from there. By the way, and I hope that just already, I'm, I'm assuming you can see this well enough in your monitor there. Um, this is supposed to be a plain grass, a, a smooth grass green field, right? But it's got all this little, sub, even that drip, which I am going to push back a little bit. All these drips, they don't, it's amazing how much, to me, it's amazing how much it doesn't bother the viewer. This is reading very nicely. 
it would be a huge mistake, in my opinion, to come in here and start slapping down thick, opaque green paint. Oh my goodness. And covering up all this loveliness. Are you kidding? No way am I going to do it. I'm going to push it back. Like these two drips and that one right there are a little bit much. So I'm going to push them back a little bit. Uh, anyway, that's one option. The other option is the sky. And again, let me, let me just think about this for a minute. Um, I, I, there's three things. First of all, the lightest, brightest white is the sky or these two field lights. Which, by the way, they didn't get, they didn't get fuzzed. I forgot about them when I was doing the fuzz layer. But that's, I am going to do a lot of fuzz on them in this, in this last layer. In fact, I, if you're with me, I'll show you how to do that. It's a lot of fun. Um, and this building... Uh, Almost, it, not almost, it fits that description of I've got to get the local color nailed down on this building. Mostly the, the yellow brick. It's there, but it's all messy. This, the, the messiness of this building is bothering me a little bit. See, all the other buildings are a little bit more nailed down. All this is pretty solid drawing. And this is drawn well. It's just too messy. So that would be one option. That would be the fourth, the local color option. You know what? I'm gonna, I've talked myself into focal point. I'm gonna start with the green grass. For some reason, it's very intuitive. This is it's not like a right or wrong. This is just, what do I feel like doing? And evidently, I feel like, I keep coming back to this, to the grass. I'm actually lowering my painting just a little bit. I'll lower you guys a little bit too, so you can still see things. I like my new tripod, by the way. It allows me to give you, to, I can go high, and, and you could look down on a painting, which, believe it or not, I know you're still getting a lot of glare right up here, but um, because you're looking down, you're getting much less glare than you used to. Okay, now, just for what it's worth, um, remember my reference over here? This, both of these, have become are taking a way back seat now to this. This this painting, the, the real painting, I'm pointing here to this. The painting is way, is trumping this stuff. So I'm going to leave this here, but I don't have to pay nearly as much attention to that now as I did in the early stages of the painting. And I put my easel down so that I can sit down here I, I, you paint better standing up. I think that's a truism. I think that's just true. But you paint better standing up until your feet are really sore, and then you don't paint better standing up anymore. So, <laughs> so I'm gonna take it easy, sit down. Okay, now this is fun. Whew, here we go. Last, final edit. Summary statement. The canvas itself the painting as it is right now tells me what colors to mix on my palette that makes sense i know you're getting a wonderful view of the top shiny top of my head sorry about that but that's just the way it goes can i zoom in a little bit to the painting a little bit okay um i'm mixing up on my palette here so, of course, at this point, almost everything is opaque. Almost everything is opaque. Which means it has white in it. Or yellow ochre, or uh, one of my favorite, Naples yellow. I love, love me some Naples yellow. <laughs> but the point is, I'm trying to match what's already here. Let's see how close I am. Um, nope, needs a little bit. Needs a little more yellow in it. Let's try that now. Yeah, that'll do. It's a little bit bright, but I think I can live with it. I'm going to come right in here, right up next to the picture. And see all these too much pencil lines? Can you see that? Let me zoom in here. Too many pencil lines, right? So I'm going to diminish them, but I'm not going to get grumpy and eliminate them. That would be a mistake. It would be a mistake to, for me. 
to wipe out all this beautiful subtlety. In fact, most of what I'm going to do in this, I mixed up a green paint, right? Right. I mean, I, mean, I mixed up an opaque paint, green opaque, yes. But uh, most, uh, most of what I'm putting on the canvas is in fact not, not opaque at all, but is rather translucent. Hey, let me take a little break here for a second. I want to show you something. My next painting class. Oh, and my sound is a little bit far away. Hang on. Hang on. Let me get my microphone back over here where you guys can hear it better. Okay. Hopefully you'll see, hear me better now. Um, my, here's a handout that I want to show you just for a minute. I'm not going to go over the whole thing. It's Dan Nelson's Dance of Painting. Good paintings are the result, that is to say, the product of good process. Again, good process produces good paintings. And I'm going to stop there. Then I compare the process to dancing. There are three couplets, large steps, small steps, light steps, dark steps, literal steps, and loose steps. And finally, this is the part I want to mention down here, finally, this entire dance, this dance takes place to the music, quote-unquote, using picturesque language, to the music of transparent, opaque, and translucent layers of paint. Transparent. Most of the layers and all the dark ones are transparent. The final layers and all the light ones are opaque. But the magical layers and the most important to manage are translucent. I put that together yesterday afternoon while I was painting, doing this painting. I said, this, this, I have to do this now. This is the time. So I took some time to do that. And I'll, I'll be using that verbiage right much in the days, years, months uh, to come. Right now I'm mixing up, trying to mix up a mid-tone bluish green to uh, to render the pitcher's shadow. Right now it's way too dark, so just lightening it. There we go. I'll save that brush. I might be using that color again. Okay, back now to translucent. And again, translucent is the most. I, I'm assuming that you all understand what the words transparent, opaque, and translucent mean. There, many times, forgive me, people who aren't extremely good with language, they think that they, they, they want to say the word transparent, but they feel like, no, that's, that's too ordinary. That, that's too common. I want to sound smarter than that. So they use a what sounds to them like a big word, and so they say the word translucent. I, I, I see this. <laughs> that sounds crazy. I see it happening all the time. They think that, oh no, transparent, that can't be it. It's, it's a more exotic word than that. So they say translucent and what they really mean. But I think if you just say all three words in one sentence in, in a row, it's uh, you, you all remember which one means which. So translucent is the magic layer and the one that requires the most management. It's sort of like loose edges are, are, are critically important for good painting, managing your edges. Well, I'm going to add to that, a very, a very close parallel to that, that managing your opacity is just as important. And there are three layers of three stages, three categories of opacity. Opaque, transparent, and the magic one, translucent, which is halfway in between. So all that that I just did right there is translucent. And I'm just going to come in here now with a few heavier bits and push back some of these drips that I told you about earlier. Now you'll notice I'm not pushing them all the way back. I'm not obliterating them. Um, I like their energy. I just don't like that, that that much of their energy. Does that make sense? I like those drips. I just don't like that much of them. So I'm diminishing them slightly. Again, 
playing with controlling transparency, playing with the how how translucent it is. Okay, I think that area of I need to mix up some more green, but I think that that area of the uh, field is done. The infield is finished. If you're a baseball player. Now, let's continue. Also, of course, it goes without saying, so I'm not going to say it. <laughs> I'm kidding. No, it, it almost goes without saying, but I have to say it. <laughs> that uh, whenever possible, whenever, whenever, whenever possible, we, the artists, we want to, we want to create a graduation, a fade. We don't want flat light to dark or warm to cool and so on and so on and so forth. So this gray big, the, the, most, the most important shape by far, this is such a clear case, the, the most important shape in this painting is this big green uh, arc wedge shape here. Um, it is very important that it not be the same color from one end to the other, but in fact that it fade. You already see that happening. It's going to be the lightest part of it. It's going to be right up here. As it goes, it's going to be the darkest part of it. It's going to be way over there. Very intentional, of course, as you know. Very intentional. So now I'm mixing up the, the perhaps the lightest of this chartreuse. I love, not only do I love the color, I love the, the word. <laughs> <laughs> painting the the lightest part of the shield and I would like you to notice too how soft this edge is yeah, I mean, this is not razor sharp this is not a place or time for razor sharp in fact I want this field this part of the field right here to just feel like it's just glowing are you with me um, again I can show you this on, on my on, oops, on my uh, sketch, the watercolor sketch that I was quite happy with. See how this just glows right there? So that's that's what I want to um, reflect in this painting. And if you want something to look like it's glowing, you give it soft edges, not hard edges. I can't tell you how many portraits I've seen, not by... Not by the masters. No, the masters all know this, but among, you know, like like state fair type competition, high school, senior, college level portraits where the sun is hitting the side of the person's face and the artist wanted to make it look like the sun was the light. The, the light was really, really hitting the, the side of the person's face. So they made it brighter, bright, 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 and razor sharp edge. <laughs> wrong, 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 wrong. Uh, now, the reason I know all these stupid things is, of course, because I've done them all. That's, that's, reason I, that's how come I know all, all these stupid mistakes. What do you think? It's because I've done every single one, most of them more than once. No, if you want it to look like the sun is hitting the the side of the, the person's face you don't make it a razor sharp edge in fact the more you want it to look like it's being just bathed in bright sun or light i keep saying sun that's what i've got, evidently I've got sun on the brain um you make it a very very soft edge i remember learning that to some degree from years ago when i was doing a uh, a william bugaro painting. Um, some of you don't know perhaps who William Bouguereau is. Man, bad for you. <laughs> You've seen his stuff, you just don't know the name, that's all. Um, but uh, French, 1890. The absolute zenith of the um, the Salon School of, of Painting in the 19th century, the 19th century salon, against which all the Impressionists and all the modern artists were rebelling was the salon school. But now that the rebellion is over, we're able to go back and appreciate Bouguereau and his compatriots 
for the consummate skill that they demonstrated. In fact, it has taken, taken serious scholars a lot of work to try to get back to, to, to and rediscover the tricks that these men learned, knew that had been handed down to them for generations and was lost in a single generation because of the temper tantrum of the art world in the 20th century. Temper tantrum, I do believe that is the best. Now, it was, it was in a sense, it was a tantrum we had to go through. Uh, but now that we're through it, where we can go back. Hey, now, just for fun. Guys, hang on for just a second. Since I'm talking about, let me, let me go get that boudoir painting. It's right out here in the hallway. I'm just stepping out right outside my door and pull it off the wall. So here's my my copy of a William Bouguereau painting. I, I did I did this under the tutelage of Tom here in Raleigh in 1998-99. Let me see if I can get this. I don't know if it'll fit on this easel or not. Some of you have seen this before, and it's it's certainly it's right there on my website. You can see it. Um, let me raise you up again so you get quite so much clear. So, um, sorry for the glare, but uh, there's, I made a few improvements. <laughs> I know that sounds arrogant, but it's true. I made a few improvements on Bougaro's face, but I want you to see the softness of, of like this bare foot, the, the glow, if you can see it, the glow from that foot extends Nearly, yeah, at least, it, yeah, I'll say half an inch out into the dark background. The glow, you may not be able to see it on your monitor. Same thing down here. Now, it's, when you get real close to the skin, the glow is very intense, but it's very soft edged. Do you see that? And uh, so I, re I was copying Bouguereau carefully, of course, and, and, uh, so because I was copying, taking very careful note, again, the glow up here. My nose. Sorry about that horrible glare that you're getting. Let me see if I can move you a little bit. There we go. There we go. So again, this the glow up here. Do you see how? Here's the dark, and here's this is a number. If this is a number, nine point five value of ten. This is a eight, maybe even a seven and a half, right along with her hair. Anyway, this was a, a delightful um, exercise for me. Hey, here's a little, funny little bit of trivia. And uh, I think only someone who had painted this could see. There's actually a mistake. There's actually, now one thing is clear, right? Bouguereau could use this woman. He could sit this woman down. He used, whoever she is, he used her for several models in several paintings. Um, but he couldn't, he couldn't get a baby to float. So this, the baby is largely from, pieced together from several models, right? Right, no cam. I mean, maybe yeah. no. He had cameras in 1890, um, but there's a, a clear mistake, and that is the light is coming from exactly this direction, and it, the baby's arm is coming from back there by the shoulder, forearm coming all the way to the to the woman's head. <laughs> there's no way in the world that this arm cannot be casting a shadow across the baby's chest, right about there. There ought to be a big shadow of the baby's arm right there. And there is none. <laughs> that's called a mistake. Um, I just think that's pretty funny. So anyway, there's there's my William Bouguereau knockoff. Um, yeah, painting, uh, copying old masters is one of the best. So I, f I finished this in 2003, but it sat in my studio for two years, completely unfinished before I finished it. And then... Uh, I'd started it in 98 or 99, so four years from start to finish. And I guess I'm estimating about 200 hours of painting, just to give you some idea in, in this painting. Okay, enough of that. That's just for fun. But I, the point I wanted to show off, talk about, show off, I wanted to show off. The point was I want to talk about that glow, okay? If you want something to look like it's glowing, you give it a very, very soft edge. Okay. Back to the now, <laughs> from the sublime to the ridiculous. I'm not sure. Um, 
turn this a little bit this way. Um, I'm trying to decide whether to go dark, darker green or come back and do, I keep hitting you, sorry about that. Uh, yeah, I'm going to go ahead and, and go dark here. So I'm mixing up a darker green so that I can come over here to this part. And again, th there's a great big drip right here. The point I really want you to see is that um, I am going to push the drip back. I'm going to make it uh, less prominent, but I'm not going to obliterate it. I'm going to push it back, but I'm going to use the texture that is created by that drip to my advantage. Oh, I just discovered a mistake in my drawing. Darn. This, the, the dirt here, I think I can fix this. The dirt here is supposed to be in an arc coming back this way. Yeah, okay, good. That's not too bad. Same thing way over there. Okay. I'll fix that in with the orange paint. So again, I want the drip to, I want to use it to create interest, but I want it more subtle than it is. So I, I can push it back but I don't get mad at it and and wipe it out as if I'm you know, don't lose my temper and say I saw what I saw that about. No, no 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 none of that kind of stuff none of that kind of stuff use it to my advantage it makes the painting more the the the, the, uh, the presence of that texture makes the painting more interesting than those of you who paint under control, so to speak. Um, I, I think a control painting can't hold a candle to an auto control painting. <laughs> that is not how I was going to end that sentence, but I'll let it go with that for right now. Making it a darker, one more time maybe, maybe for the last time, a, a darker green. So I go all the way in here to the corner. There's a real fine line between loose and unfinished. <laughs> you don't want your viewers to feel like, well, you just quit at some point. You want them to feel like you finished, but you don't want to get tight way over there at the edge. Okay, tell you what, I'm, let me... While I'm here, pardon my shiny head. And got beautiful afternoon sun streaming in my uh, studio window to my right over there. Got okay, clean brushes. Again, I repeat myself so many times. But let me say this again. Um. In the opaque realm, when you get down to, in my case, in my style of painting, when you get down to the opaque stage, then This very new dynamic comes into play. The dynamic is this. Once you put down a light, you need to say, when I say light, you know it's opaque. Once you put down a light color, it's almost always a good idea to come back and do a slightly lighter opaque color on top of what you just put down. Slightly is the word. So I'm trying to mix up here a green that is just slightly lighter than what's over here. Oops, that's a little bit too too uh, light. That, that doesn't qualify as slight. That's too strong. So I'll be. I should be able to blend that in with some, with the right. There we go. That's about right. There we go. Okay, now I'm doing it here on a, a great, a huge piece of of the, the painting but this applies just as much to little tiny uh, bits of the painting as well as it does to great big pieces of course this gives me just a, one more chance to draw this uh, left fielder out here
So in this case, not only am I doing this principle of coming back and doing something light, I'm also increasing the, the graduation effect that I am so intent on preserving here. But I'll be doing this throughout the entire uh, final edit stage after I put down a color, especially if it's a color that you put down here, 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 and here. If you put it on several places, it's paramount, in my opinion, it's paramount that you come back and break up, break that value uh, by, by coming back with a lighter value. Always lighter. Does it work? If it, for, is, is it the same for slightly darker? No, it is not. Uh-uh. Slightly lighter. I'm not, slightly darker is not the same. does not have the same effect. Human beings like, like seeing dark paint on top of light paint. We do not like seeing light paint on top of, of dark paint. Wow. Okay, I, I don't know how that's looking to you guys, but um, I'm not bragging here. You understand that. That's, that field is gorgeous. I'm happy with that. Wow. Okay, now let's since I've since I just j this is just pure um, efficiency. Since I've got um, this nice uh, green mixed up on my brushes, let's just go ahead and hit some. I'm looking at my photograph now. Make sure I'm doing it in the right place. Let's let's hit this again. Uh, I. I might call this, I call it light opaque highlights, I call it. That's the name of it, opaque, because I'm using opaque paint. Well, what I'm putting on the canvas right now is most certainly not opaque. It is translucent. Please understand the difference. You can see if it is. And also, I'm eliminating some of the pencil. How much? Huh, just as much as to make it look good. I want a little bit of it to show through, but not too much. There's not a formula. You paint with your eyeballs. You always, always, always paint with your eyeballs. Nothing else. And once again, this is a flat plane. Are you with me? Right? That's why it, I didn't paint it flat. It's lighter to darker. Darker down here, lighter up here. Don't you? It's a good idea to come back, mix up something slightly lighter. Again, so doing two things. One is executing this principle of come back with something lighter, but I'm also in, uh, ex accentuating, exaggerating the principle of a fade, a graduation from light to dark. Uh, what next? I think that's that's the only that's the only thing in the painting. I believe I'm looking at the photograph here. That is that is green green green. Do, 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 Some. Uh, so, but let's move on to the I, again just for efficiency. I'm just going to stick with the green theme for a little while here, just just so I don't have to clean brushes and stuff like that. So I'm mixing up a darker, darker and duller green for. A bit more. Um, there we go. Uh, these are bushes, hedges, a, he a hedge in here. Hang on, buddy. Okay. I thought I had to adjust my iTunes for a second, but I don't. We're okay. Again, translucent color, allowing it as much of the underpainting to show through uh, as I can, because the transparent underpainting is more interesting than the opaque stuff that I'm putting on top. Now, let me, let me go ahead and finish that thought. If transparent color is more interesting than opaque, which it is always, then why wouldn't you just paint in 100% transparent color? Are you with me? Transparent color, this, by the way, this, uh, when I say it's more interesting, I don't mean, this is not like a matter of opinion. Well, I think that opaque color, no, 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 I'm talking like a physics professor. Uh, transparent color, there is no debate here. 
transparent colors are more complex, more rich than than uh, opaque colors. Opaque color is a one bounce. Transparent is a bounce transit bounce transit um, glow. Uh, there, there's a word I'm looking for. I'm, I'm escaping, escaping me right now. Okay, so it's not like oh no, I think opaque colors are more interesting. Uh -uh. Not a, not not a matter of opinion. Not up for a vote. Okay, so the question is though, if if transparent is more interesting than opaque, then why not paint in all transparents? Because right now I'm putting opaque paints on, right? Glad you asked that question. Real easy answer. The answer is because the principle of variety trumps the principle, the, the advantageous or the benefits or the preferred preferability of transparency. Okay, transparent colors are more rich, complex, and interesting than opaque colors. And why not use all transparent? The answer is because you get even more visual points for the principle of variety. Some opaque, some transparent. That's why, that's why you don't paint in all transparent because the variety is even more beautiful. Okay, so here again, I just put down one color green and I'm coming back. This is a, a set of bushes as far as I can tell by this photo, by the photograph here. It's just a little sort of landscaped area, but I'm just going to leave it as a set of bushes. And then coming back to this section, I'm not sure what this is supposed to be. Again, it's just a, an interesting arrangement of bushes as far as I can tell. I don't think it's a letter A or the letter H or anything. I it doesn't quite make it. Okay. There is now, but I've got this duller green. This sign up here. It's definitely, whoops. Not that far up, sorry. Mistake, down here, this is green. Yeah, 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 there we go. So I'm gonna paint with a rag now and try to remove some of this green that I just put up here a minute ago. There we go. I use that expression a lot when I'm teaching. Paint with a rag. Anytime you, you have to wipe, if you have to wipe something off your canvas, you don't do it with that grumpy old rucka shaka rucka I made a mistake attitude. Not at all. You paint with a rag. That means you don't go. Wah, 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 wah. You, you know, that's not painting. That's just wiping off. So you have to go slow to it. To it if you catch my drift. Okay. There's some greenery trees over here. Again, I'm looking at the photograph going back and forth. And if I do that color, then it behooves me <laughs> to come back with a slightly lighter color. We like it. Now it looks like a painting. Before that, it just looked like a bunch of green paint that fell off the truck and landed there. Now it looks like a bit of a painting. Same thing, by the way, or even on this flat surface, this sign over here. I don't want it to be flat. I want to graduate from light, lighter to darker. I don't want... Now, of course, you get carried away. At some point, something's got to be flat. But as much as possible, make everything um, molded, so to speak. Okay, I think I'm just about ready for a little break here. Uh, thank you for your company. Um, but what I'm doing now is almost going to get a little boring. Um, this dark green, by the way, is almost perfectly finished. I, all I need to do in here is come in some of the delightful extraneous marks. I just need to push them back a little bit. Like these, this red swoosh, there, there, and there. I love them. 
and uh, but I, I need to push them back just a little bit so it looks a little more like a baseball field, a little less like a random strokes of paint. But I'm not going to cover them up. I'm going to just push them back a little bit. Likewise, this the uh, the dirt here needs to get quite a bit brighter, lighter, brighter, and uh, I might might tackle that next when I have that finished. Then the focal point of the painting will be done. Well, little bits on the players, and I can begin to branch out from there. Okay, but I want to paint by myself for a little while. I'll bring you back in before I finish the painting. I appreciate your company very much. And as I said, I'll bring you back. I, I really am hoping I can keep up my energy and finish this painting tonight. It's a quarter to six in the evening here where I am. So I've got my work cut out for me to finish. I would guess that I've got two and a half more hours of work on the painting. And uh, before I go to bed, I'll probably have supper with the family and, you know, stuff like that. But I'll bring you back in. Thanks for watching. Be